Okay, so let's begin the class. So in the last class we were talking about how to calculate the risk-free rate. We said that usually we use the 10-year government bond. Then we said what about if government is risky? The government bond is risky. Well then we said we go check the rating agency rating for the country. The rating agency will tell us how risky the country is. And then we can add on some percentage, right, for the riskiness. So say that the Indian bond 10-year rate is 7%. The riskiness of the country is 3%. Then the risk-free rate, no risk, is 4%. So we finished there the last time. So let's uh, look at some of the ratings of countries. This website is tradingeconomics.com. It has just information, right? This information is credit rating, country lists, credit rating. Can the company pay back the money that it got a lend off? Credit is related to loans or lending. So here we have different, the three main companies, S&P, Moody's, and Fitch. Here, trading economics have their own rating, a little bit easier to read, a score from 100, okay? So if we go down here at the bottom, they have what does it mean? So S, the top one, trading economics give 100%. AAA, 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 S&P, Moody's and Fitch. This means prime, best in the world, right? Next we have 95, AA plus, AA1, AA plus, high grade investment. Next, AA, still high grade investment. Okay, down A plus A, upper medium grade. Down here B, B plus, lower medium grade. Okay, down here uh, non investment grade. Okay, so we have three B's, lower medium grade. Two B's, non investment. Moody's is B A one. We go down here, highly speculative. So a lot of investment companies. If your country is rated below this line. They're not going to buy your country's bonds, okay? Especially pension funds. Pension funds can only invest in safe investments. So if, if your company or country's bond is rated below here, they have to sell it automatically, right? They don't, the fund manager can't make that decision. That's the rule of his company. The rule of his company is, the bond is rated BB+, you're not allowed to buy that. Okay, so that's what this means, non-investment grade. Some people who want more risk will buy this kind of bond. Then down to bottom grade is CCC or D. Okay, extremely speculative. So let's look at some countries. So let's look at uh, China. China is uh, AA. So... Uh, China is AA stable. What score is this? 79. 79 on the list, right? What about Brazil? We talked about Brazil. Brazil is uh, BB, B minus. Is that investment or non investment? Hmm? Barely investment, right? On the thing. 47 is its score from. And then here we can see stable. Going up or going down or stable, okay? Uh, other countries we looked at was India. Where is India here? Uh, India is here. It's exactly the same as Brazil, BBB minus, okay? Just inside the investment grade. 46 is the score from 100, okay? Uh, then let's have a look at uh, Russia. 
One is BB plus, another one is BBB minus. Okay, so overall score is 50, very similar to Brazil and India. What about South Korea? A plus. Okay. Uh, a3, so it's not in the highest grade, but the score is 81 for Korea, South Korea. Okay. Uh, what about the United States? AA plus, this was controversial. Uh, S&P moved <coughs> the US down to AA plus, but the other agencies, agencies still have AAA, AAA, and its score is 97. Okay. There are some countries whose score is 100 here. Switzerland, we can see Switzerland has a hundred score. Okay, other countries maybe Germany very high, Finland. Okay, so this is giving country a score. Are they able to pay back their debt? What kind of things affect the country's ability to pay back the loan? What kind of things does the rating agency check? Deciding whether a con the country can pay back the loan or not. What do you think? The amount of debt is the most important one, right? If my debt is very low, it's easy to pay back. If my debt is very high, it's not easy to pay back. Okay? That's very important. Anything else apart from the amount of debt? Why do you think Germany or Switzerland has a rating of 100, but Brazil has a rating of 50 or 47? Any ideas? Why do people trust Germany to pay back the money more than Brazil or India? It's history and... History and? It's a highly developed country, right? The economy is highly developed. So they look at the German economy and they say they have a lot of industries and companies like BMW or Deutsche Bank or Siemens who are doing good business, right? The government can collect the tax from those companies. So we think the government will be able to pay back, right? The economy is going well. People have jobs, unemployment is low, okay? So the government should be able to pay back their loan. So we can take this rating for Brazil, and we can say that Brazil's government bond is not risk-free, because the rating agency says Brazil is just 47 or BBB minus, okay? So we can say that's equivalent to 3%. There's a table, okay? So then we can find a risk-free rate for Brazil. You have to take away the risk according to the rating agency from their government bond price. So, do you have any question about this? Can you find a risk-free rate for any country now? It's easy for the AA countries, right? You just go and look at their government bond price. It's not easy for the countries which are not A countries. Okay, we need to go check their rating and find out what's the equivalent. Rating is BB, 3%. Okay, then take their 10-year bond minus 3%. So just another note on uh, government bonds. But we said that bonds is usually inflation plus uh, the patients or the real interest rate, okay? So there was some time when we had a negative real interest rate because bond, other things affect the price of bonds, okay? Mainly supply and demand. Do you understand supply and demand? Mm -hmm. How do you say supply and demand in Korea? Okay. So we have bonds which are being sold in the market. We have an inflation rate. We have a real interest rate. The bond, a risk-free bond should be the inflation rate plus the real interest rate, okay? But there are some things which affect this. The first one is a safe haven. Do you understand safe haven effect? This is what we're talking about here. So 
safe haven effect means that there is a lot of risk, so I want to find a safe place. Okay? Safe haven. It's like a ship in a storm. There's a storm, so the ship goes into the safe place, safe haven. So safe haven effect for bonds, we can see mainly with Switzerland, the US, and Germany. Okay? Because when there is a lot of risk in the world, the stock market is going down. Okay? Where are people going to invest their money? In stocks? Stock market is going down every day. There is a crisis. What are you going to do with your money? Maybe buy bonds instead, right? So people start buying gold. Right? Gold is another safe haven asset. The price of gold goes up. They also start buying US government bonds. Okay, so because of supply and demand, uh, the real interest rate is going to be below zero sometimes in a crisis for the US bond. Okay? So this is a case here. We already talked about the Treasury Inflation Protected Securities. So the Treasury is the US government sells these bonds at negative yields, negative interest rates, as buyers doubt Fernanke. So this story was from 2013, okay? So it means that the re this tips was in negative. People were paying the US government money uh, to hold their money. Imagine you deposit money in the bank and you pay the bank money. The bank doesn't pay you interest. You pay them money just for holding your money, right? So it was a little bit like this in, in the US. So we should understand another effect, which is global savings glut. So the world has too much savings, right? Or not too much, but it has a lot of savings because the population is getting older. People are saving their money. Do you have much savings? You're a student, right? Maybe you don't have much savings. When you start working, you save money. Probably you'll save towards a pension. So at the moment, there's a lot of money going around the world. It's called global savings glut. Okay? People are looking for places to invest their money. Is this going to increase demand of bonds or increase supply of bonds? There's a lot of savings looking for somewhere to invest. Can you understand that idea? Mm -hmm. Right? There's oil money from the Middle East. Okay? There's pension funds from countries like the UK or Korea or the US. A lot of this money looking for somewhere to invest. Is that going to increase or decrease the demand for bonds? Increase. Increase. increase the demand, okay? So we have these other things which can affect the price of bonds. So sometimes, like in this case, the bond can have a negative real interest rate, okay? Which is the bond price is lower than inflation, okay? The interest rate can be lower than inflation. This can happen because other things affect the price of bonds. So just I want to just point that out, but anyway, we use the bond as a, uh, this US bond as a risk free rate. Okay, another thing which recently, it's not a long term thing, what happened recently is quantitative easing, where the US government was also buying the US bonds. Okay, what's going to happen if the US, gov if, uh, sorry, the US Treasury, the US Central Bank starts buying bonds? It increases the demand again. Okay, so when we're increasing demand for the bonds, the interest rate goes down. Okay, so if we say that, we said at the start that the hurdle rate, hurdle rate is equal to risk free rate. Right, plus beta times the risk premium. So if we reduce the risk-free rate, if we make this smaller, are companies more likely or less likely to invest in a project? More likely. More likely. Okay? Are people more likely or less likely to invest in stocks? Is this number going to be bigger or bigger or smaller if we decrease the risk-free rate? If this number gets lower, this plus this, is it going to be a lower number or a higher number? Lower. It's going to be a lower number. Is our hurdle rate going to be lower or higher? Lower. The hurdle is going to get lower. Okay? So 
So people will invest in more projects, they will invest in more stocks. So this was one of the uh, reasons that we have this QE program. The QE program is the central bank buying the government bonds, increasing the demand for the government bond. Okay? So we have safe haven effect, global savings glut. We have central banks getting involved. Usually central banks are not involved in buying the government bonds. Okay? But sometimes they do. This can cause inflation. Okay? So the, if the central bank buys the government bond, increasing demand for the government bond, the interest rate is going to go down. Okay? People will accept lower interest. And the risk-free rate will be lower. So it makes it cheaper for companies to start investing money. Okay? So the US has stopped doing QE now. This is called QE. But Europe has started. Japan and the UK also have kind of this kind of QE program. So uh, do you have any questions about the risk-free rate? The last two things I said were kind of just side points about the risk-free rate. Do you have any questions about that? No? Okay, so discuss these questions with your partner. So go so young. Go so young here today. Some students are missing today. Uh, go young hun. Kim do young. Yes. So what do you think about the first question? Don't know. Kim Mi Jin. Kim Bo Ran. She's not here. Kim Bo Mi. Yes. <laughs> How can we calculate the risk free rate generally? Hmm? 
Oh, you weren't here the last two classes? Kim Suin? Yes? What's the answer? What government bond? Which government in Europe? Germany. Germany, okay. So we use the German government bond to calculate the risk-free rate for euros. Why did you choose the German government bond? Hmm? How can we know that Germany is the best, con safest country? Yes, so we look at this, right? We can see Germany. Where is Germany? Germany is here. A, 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 Okay? So Germany is like top score in the Eurozone, right? 99 from 100. Okay? So that's risk free for Euros. Okay? Uh, the next question uh, Kim Jin Su. He's not here. So, do you know why students are missing today? Management training? Hmm? For, is it, I thought it was just for first year students. Hmm? Some second year students are going to. Kim Tae Su? Kim Yee Na? Kim Hui Jin? That's me. <laughs> so what's the answer? <laughs> How should we calculate the risk-free rate for Chinese RMB? Using Chinese. Chinese government bond. Just take the Chinese government bond rate. That's okay. Or do we need to do something else? Something else. What else do we need to do? China is not an AA rate, AAA rate country. What? So if we go here, we can see that China is not an AAA rated country like Germany, no risk country, right? Yeah. What does rating does China have? AA minus. So we can go down here and check on the thing. What is AA minus? AA minus is here, just in high grade. Okay. So we'll go across. It won't be very much. It might be 0 0.1 percent or 0 0.2 percent. We'll have to subtract from the number, okay, to make it risk free, okay? So this much risk, there's this much risk included in the Chinese bond, so we need to subtract that to make it risk free. Okay, does anybody have any other questions about calculating the risk free rate? We'll see later this table, I have, later on we'll look in more detail, we can see this table where the rating is, goes to a percent, okay? So, Let's move on then to talk about the second part, the equity risk premium. So what we've done is we, we study time value of money. So we, we said that time value of money has three things, right? It has inflation, it has the real interest rate, and it has risk. Those three things, right? So what we've got here with our risk-free rate, what is included here? Inflation. Inflation, right? What else is included here? The real interest rate. The real interest rate. So we are just, this is risk, risk premium for the stock, right? Because we have to include inflation, right? Because if I tell you that I'm going to make a profit of 10% next year in Argentina, it sounds good, right? I'll make a profit of 10%. But if inflation in Argentina is 20%, are you happy? No, you're not, right? So here with the government bond, we're taking into account if we have to make more than inflation. We have to make more than the real interest rate because we have more risk. And this is going to be called the risk for stocks, right? Or for our company, this part is the risk, okay? Here we have inflation. This is risk-free, not risk not included. So inflation and the real interest rate, okay? We said it might be a little bit different depending on supply and demand for bonds. Okay, and then uh, a risk premium. So we are going to look at how we can calculate this risk premium. So the risk premium is the premium that investors demand for investing in an average risk investment relative to the risk-free rate. 
it has to be more than zero. So this has to be more than zero. It doesn't make sense, otherwise people would just invest here, right? Increase with the risk inversion of the investors. So investors don't like risk, this is going to be higher. Investors like risk, it's going to be lower, right? For example, there's a crisis, investors don't like risk, it's going to be higher, okay? Increases with the riskiness of the average risk investment. So let's uh, find out your risk premium. So discuss with your partner. Stocks are the only risky assets and you have just two opportunities for your investment. First, your first investment, government bond, which is paying 5%. Okay? Second investment, a mutual fund of all stocks. We already talked about mutual fund, right? So we invest in a fund which invests in one of every stock and we don't know what the return is going to be. So how much of an expected return, how much extra money would you like to change your money from the riskless asset to the mutual fund? Okay, You can get 5% in the riskless asset, the government bond. So if I ask you to invest in stocks instead of that, and it's 5%, what are you going to say? You can invest in the government bond for 5%, you'll definitely 100% risk free get your 5% back. You can invest in all stocks, fund of stocks for 5%, the value can go up or down. Okay? Which one do you want to invest in? Government bonds, right? Clearly. So the question is, how much more are you going to demand before you invest in stocks? So nobody's going to say less than 5%, right? So choose a number. What do you think? What kind of profit are you going to expect to make from the stocks before you invest in the stocks? If you expect just to make a 5% profit from the stocks, you're not going to invest there. You're going to invest in the government bond. It's risk-free, okay? So what profit that you could possibly make with the stocks is going to encourage you to change from the stocks, sorry, to change from the bond and invest in the stocks? So discuss with your partner. What percent profit do you want from the stocks before you're going to change your investment from bonds to stocks? Okay, so uh, back to you. Back to you. Back to you. Anastasia? Yes? More than 13%? Okay, what about John Gion? E. G. Song? Yes? B between 5 and 7%. Okay, so you guys are from Russia and you guys are from Korea, so you might have a little bit different idea. The Russian stock market would be more volatile perhaps, or inflation would be higher in Russia, right? So maybe you're thinking bigger numbers than the Korean students, okay? So most people would choose this one, between 9 and 11%. Okay, this seems to be the average what people choose. They want an extra, they want the stock company to tell them, we are going to make a profit of 10%, right? 
then they might decide it's worth the risk that the stock price could go down. Okay? They expect the profit to be 10%. So, uh, if we were looking at the whole market, the risk premium would be a weighted average of the risk premiums demanded by each and every investor. So we would get every investor and we would ask them, what's your premium? And then get the average, okay? Then that would be like a risk premium, okay? Of course, some investors are wealthier than other investors. For example, Warren Buffet invests a lot of money in the markets. So his, his idea would be more powerful than your idea, okay? And of course, if investors are more risk averse, we would expect this premium to increase. So in times when the stock market is going up and down very much, right, or especially going down a lot, we would expect that people would, would want a uh, higher one. So let's discuss this with your partner. So assume you're making the same choice, but you're making it in the aftermath of a stock market crash. Do you understand crash? Goes down a lot, right? It has dropped 25% in the last month. Would you change your answer? So, would you want a larger premium, a smaller premium, or the same? So, discuss with your partner. Why? Uh, because it's uh, more risky now to invest uh, uh, to stocks. Okay, so it just you think it's more risky now than normally, yes. right? So you're going to ask for a higher premium. Yes, because the bonds. Okay, so that's true, right? So the premium can change over time. This can change depending on uh, how do <coughs> investors feel about risk. They talk about risk on and risk off. Do you understand risk on, risk off? Yeah. Sometimes they talk about the market. The market is risk on. It means investors feel very optimistic, right? They're taking their money out of gold and out of bonds and investing in stocks. The economy is growing quickly, okay? Then risk off, the economy has some problem, okay? The stock market, people are taking their money out of stocks and investing in bonds and gold. That's risk off, okay? So if investors are risk on or risk off, then the risk premium changes. Risk off gets higher. Okay? Risk on gets lower. <clears throat> so how can we figure out this in practice? How, how do companies figure out this risk premium? So one option is we can make a survey. We can just ask investors, like I just asked you, what's your risk premium? And then use the average. Okay? The other way is, this is the way that we're, is most commonly used, is using the historical data. Again, it's hard to predict the future, okay? but one way that can help us is by looking at the past, looking at the historical prices. So we'll explain more about this. And then another common way is the implied premium. We'll explain about this. So the first one is the survey approach. So we can't ask all the investors, but we can ask some individuals. Like, do you understand CFO? What does CFO mean? Chief Financial Officer. Chief Financial Officer, right? In the US, CEO, Chief Executive Officer. CFO, Chief Financial Officer, right? Top Financial Manager. We can ask them of the big companies. What do you think the risk premium is? Okay? But this is not really used widely in practice has some limitation. There's no constraints on reasonability. Somebody could say 50%, right? Could throw the results out. Okay, again, the results show the past, and they tend to be short term. The CFOs uh, or the surveys is just asking them about next year. So 
So for example, here we surveyed individual investors. They said 8.3% in 2004, right? So they said the premium, more than the bond, 8.3%. Institutional investors, 2013, they said 4.8%. CFOs, 2012, 4.48%. Analysts 5%, okay? So we said that this was about the average between 4 and 6% premium, right? So we can see that if we do a survey, they're saying the same the CFOs and analysts. Academics means working in the university, okay? They're a little bit more cautious than the people in the financial industry. So the second one is the one that we're going to say is widely used. We understand default approach. Default means just it's, if, if it's the one normally used by companies to arrive at the premium. So how does this approach work? First of all, we take a period in the past for estimating. Okay? For example, the US stock market is one of the oldest stock markets in the world. So they have information from 1928, from 1962. So we decide a date until now. Then we get the average returns on the stock index during the period. So the average returns on the stock index, we look at the, ch the change in the stock price, okay? Dividends plus dividends over the old stock price. Then we can see the change. So last, let's say our stock price is 50, our dividends are 5, right? So last year our stock price was 55, was uh, 40. So how much did it change? Okay. So it went up 50, it went up by 10, plus 5 is 15. And then last year the, it was 40. So how much percent? So let's say it was 50. So it went up 30% last year, right? Or it went down by 30% last year. Okay. So we, we do this, we calculate the average return on the stock index. Okay? Do you understand the average return? This is what we're talking about return. If your stock price goes up, do you make a profit? If the stock price goes up, do you make a profit? Yes. yes. If you get dividends from the company, do you make a profit? Yes. yes. So we add up the change in the stock price plus the dividends. Okay? Then we need that in a percentage number. So what was it last year? So compared to last year, more than it went up. My profit was 15%. My stock price went up 10. I got five of dividends. I made 15% profit last year, or 30% profit, right? Last year. So I do this for uh, this stock index from this time to this time. Then I get my returns for the U.S. government bond. What was my returns on the U.S. government bond? Easier to calculate, right? It's going to be the uh, interest rate every year. Okay, let's say now it's two percent, so two percent a year. Then I look at the difference between the two averages, and we use this as a premium looking forward. So here we had thirty percent, right? And here we had two percent, but this was just one year. Okay, one year was up thirty percent, but another year it wasn't. Maybe it was down twenty percent. Okay. So overall we get the average and we figure out maybe the difference between this and this one is 5% over the long term. Okay, so this is how we do find the historical premium. What is the difference between the average return on the stocks and the average return on the bonds over the long period? <coughs> do you have any question about this, this part? Okay, so we can actually see that on the, we can check this, right? We don't have to calculate this because somebody else has calculated that. That's common knowledge. The average returns in the US from 1928 until today, somebody has done that calculation. So we can see that the guy who wrote the book that we're uh, studying, right? His name is uh, Damaradon and he has his own web page and he puts this premium on his web page for people to see, right? Because he, he calculated the premium. So uh, we can see that. 
the internet works. Okay, so I think, anyway, I think it's about five point something at the moment, right? The, just his website is not coming up right now. Maybe it will come up in a minute. Uh, so we can find that, we can calculate that ourselves, or we can find it in another source. Okay? So, <clears throat> there are a couple of limitations of this approach. It assumes that investors have not really changed over time, that investors in 1962 were similar to investors today. Okay? Uh, it also assumes the riskiness of a risky portfolio, the stock index has not changed in a systematic way across time. So we talked about the S&P 500, okay? Did the S&P 500 change a lot since 1960 to today? Because we're using the S&P 500 to calculate the average returns, okay? So is the S&P similar today to the past? It might be a little bit different. So that's uh, a limitation. So let's have a look at some of the numbers, right? So what's the best time? It's better to go back very far, because in statistics, we have this thing called standard error. So if the further we go back, the less error there is in the data, in the statistics. So we, we go back here, we, we can do just this one, 2002 to 2012, 1962 or 1928, right? So we can see that, the numbers can be a little bit different. So we are going to use this line. The next one, if we are just talking about investing for one year, we can look at T-bills. This is, T-bills is, is a name for basically one-year bonds in the US, right? Bonds is uh, 10 years, right? So we are more interested in 10 years. We're thinking about 10 years. So we take bonds, but we could take bills for one year. Okay, then, uh, we can use the arithmetic average or geometric average. We don't need to understand, it's just maths, right? So this one is better for the short term, and this one is better for the long term. So we're going to use this one. So we find that stocks, bonds, this average, 1928, 4.2%, okay? So that's the historical, using the historical premium. Then we have, uh, if we use just 1962, it changes to 2.9%. If we use from 2002 to 2012, it's going to be 1.17%. So, uh, we can decide, but further back in time is, as this one, the data might not be that reliable, because we don't have that many data points. Have you studied statistics before? Yes, then you will know that the more data points that we have, uh, the more reliable the number is. <coughs> so that's fine for the United States, right? So we saw we can use this number, 4.2%. Okay? We can take that and we can put it here. Risk premium. So now we know our risk free, and now we know our risk premium, and we just need to calculate our beta, right? But what about if we're outside the United States? Okay? So this we calculated, this was for the US, the S&P 500 index in the US, okay? So what about outside the US? So historical data outside the US is for much shorter time periods. The stock market didn't exist as long, right? How, when was the Korean stock market started? How long do we have reliable data for the Korean stock market? Not the same as the US, not as far back as the US, right? And there are other countries that have even younger stock markets. So, especially in emerging markets. So, this can give us some data problem. Okay, there's more error when we calculate for countries which have very young stock markets. So, one solution is that we can use our US premium which is a reliable because it goes back to 1928 in the US, okay? Nearly 100 years. And we can adjust for the country's bond rating, okay? And default spread. So we can say this is the risk premium in the US, 
And then the credit rating agency says that that country is that percent more risky than the US, so just add on that percent. Okay? So we already looked at the rating agency's ratings. Can you remember the rating of Korea? A plus, right? 79 on the trading economics, okay? These ratings reflect the political and economic stability of these countries. The rating agencies looks at the political stability, economic stability. So we could call this a kind of country risk. So a country risk number. So we saw India has a rating of BA2 from Moody's. So the typical default spread for BA2 rated bonds is 3%. So it means that your bond is BA2, it's going to be 3% more risk than a, a bond. So analysts can just add this default spread to come up with a risk premium for India. Okay? So uh, let's say that we just add, this one says 2008, but we saw 2012, it was 4.2. So if we add on uh, the 3% to India, then uh, we can have 4.2 plus 3% for India. It's going to be, the risk premium will be 7% for India. Okay? So we get our risk premium from the US. We get our credit rating for India, BA2. We say BA2 is equals to 3%. So this risk premium is 7.2% for India. Okay? So that is one way, simple way. There's a little bit more accurate way. Because this 3% is reflecting the risk more of the bond market and bonds. But stocks are actually riskier than bonds. Stock market is riskier than bond market. So we need to change this 3% to a higher number. So how do we do that? So default risk spreads and equity premiums are highly correlated, but we expect equity spreads to be higher than debt spreads. So this is just saying equity uh, is going to be more risky than debt. So we can get this risk premium for Brazil, for example. It's easier if we look at an example. We find uh, the standard deviation in the Bovespa, which is the index in Brazil, is 34%. We find the standard deviation in Brazilian bonds is 21%. So which is more risky here, the bonds or the stocks in Brazil? <coughs> stocks, right? We already looked at standard deviation, we did the exercise for homework. We said that the standard deviation is measuring how far we move away from the average. Okay? So we expect that the bonds move less than the stock away from the average. So the Brazilian bond has a default spread of 2.5%. Maybe it's BA1, not BA2. Okay, so we find a country risk premium for Brazil, for equity, is 2.5%, and then we take these standard deviations, 34% over 21.5%. So this number is going to be bigger than one, higher than one, right? That looks like about 1.5, something like that, okay? And we multiply this by the bond risk premium and we get equity risk premium, 3.95%. So the total risk premium is equal to the US risk premium for Brazil, US risk premium, plus the country risk premium for Brazil. So if we set 4.2% here, then we add on the Brazilian one, which is now Higher than 3%, it's 3.95%, okay? And we get 8.15%. We can put here for Brazil. So, that's a little bit complicated, but all we're doing is we're saying we have the risk premium for the US. Brazil is riskier than the US. How much riskier than the US is it, okay? The rating agency says the bonds, the bonds are 2.75% riskier. Okay, but now we're talking about stocks. So this, we could use this 2.75% number, that the bonds are more risky, but that's not accurate, because Brazilian stocks are more risky than Brazilian bonds. Okay, 
So we're going to say that Brazilian stocks are 1.5 times more risky than Brazilian bonds. So we multiply this number by 1.5 and we get a more accurate number for the difference between risk in Brazilian, US stocks and Brazilian stocks. So let's just try this, uh, cut this uh, just before the break while we're still talking about this. You try to make uh, a risk premium for India. Okay? You have this information. And I want you to tell me, what is the number here, the risk premium for India? I'm telling you the standard deviation of their stock. This is the Sensex Indian Stock Index. Standard deviation of bonds. I'm telling you, their deep, we already said India's default spread is 3%. Okay? Uh, so what, the question is really, what is the country risk premium for India? Okay? That is the default spread multiplied by the standard deviation of equity over standard deviation of bonds. If you tell me that, then you can tell me the country risk premium for India, and we'll know the, the risk premium. Okay? So, try to do this calculation. Discuss with your partner.